Shalom. Welcome to King James Bible University, San Antonio. Today's teaching is entitled The Rapture, Biblical or Gentile Fiction. So we're going to take a look into this doctrine that has been uh, pushed in Christianity and also in camps for a long time. And we're going to examine it via the scriptures and via history. And we're going to discover the origin and, and see what's going on. So stay with us and let us get started. As we prepare to get started in today's lesson, I want to cover a few things with you from the scriptures uh, to let you know where we stand here at King James Bible University. OK, um, we use the Bible, King James Version, uh, 1611, also including the Apocrypha as our source material. OK, our primary source and our source of all biblical teachings comes from the Bible. We don't use uh, other books such as concordances. Um, commentaries, etc. But we use the scriptures because we're going to find here as I read this to you that we were admonished by the Most High to do such and that's what we uh, aim to follow and that's what we follow over here at the university. Uh, Isaiah 34 16 says seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. So we are admonished to read out of the Bible. It says no, no one of these shall fail none shall want her mate for my mouth it have commanded, and his spirit it have gathered them. In other words, you can't make other sources or other books with the scriptures. You have to know how to use the scriptures, and you must let the scriptures declare itself. Okay? Uh, Ecclesiastes 12.9, it says, Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even the words of truth. So when the preacher that is described of in Ecclesiastes is seeking out these words and knowledge, his source was the scriptures. He didn't use other books. He didn't use the writings of the heathens or the Gentiles. Uh, he didn't use Babylonian texts. He used the Bible. He used the scriptures. OK, and that's what we're going to do today. And the reason why we must use the scriptures, go to Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. It says, whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall the most high teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So the Bible is designed in such a way that we have to understand the scriptures precept by precept. Everything is built upon each other and there's a constant flow from the beginning to the end. OK, and so the found, primary foundation of the scriptures is the books of Moses and then the prophets built on top of that foundation on down to uh, what we have the New Testament, the Apocrypha and the New Testament. So everything in the Bible is taught in this way. And so in order to study the scriptures and to study a subject, we must analyze it through biblical sources or the scriptures, line up on line, precept on precept. And that's what we plan to do this afternoon. So I pray that you stay tuned with us as we proceed to go forward. As noted uh, with today's uh, lesson about the rapture, we are going to look out and find out a definition from a Christian source of what the rapture is. So the question is, what is the rapture? So I went online and I went to uh, a very world-renowned uh, evangelist and preacher in the Christian arena, the late Billy Graham. And according to BillyGraham.org, I pulled this information. And so he had a question on his page, what is the rapture? And it says, there are many Christians who believe that the second coming of Jesus Christ will be in two phases. First, he will come for believers, both living and dead, in the rapture. And Billy Graham says, read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 17. 
In this view, the rapture, which is the transformation and catching up of all Christians, dead or alive, to meet Christ in the air, will be secret, for it will be unknown to the world of unbelievers at the time of its happening. And so, Billy Graham, like most Christians, believe in a rapture, and he says that the rapture is a catching up of Christians dead and alive to meet Jesus in the air, in the sky, and it will be secret. And also, um, remember those who are left behind who don't make this rapture event, and that's why the Christians are always talking about be rapture ready, who don't make this rapture event, they will be left into the great tribulation and there will be, you know, death and destruction, so on and so forth. And so Christianity is putting all of its hope on a rapture. And these preachers are telling millions of people around the world and many Israelites included in those congregations, you must make sure you're ready for the rapture. And so this rapture has been talked about and pushed for over the last, say, 150, 160 years. And so we want to find out the origin. And so according to BillyGraham.org and other Christian sources, the rapture is an event where the second coming of Christ is, will be in two phases. We don't see a two phase in the Bible, but that's what they believe. And uh, he will come for the believer, the believing Christian, both living and dead. And they will be caught up from the earth beamed out of airplanes, beamed out of buses, come up out of the graves and meet Jesus in the sky. And it will nobody knows the day or the hour when this is going to happen. And so that's the Christian uh, concept of the rapture. And we want to find out, is this concept biblical or is it Gentile fiction? So let's get moving. Based on the doctrine of the rapture that is found in Christianity, um, I want to pull for you a clip of a film that was created in the 1970s. It's around 1973, and it's called A Thief in the Night. Many of you may not be familiar with this film, or some may have seen it. Um, I do have, actually, I do have this film on DVD, and uh, I had it for some, quite some time. And it's a series of films. So Thief in the Night is the first film that was created in 73 dealing with this rapture uh, principle that Christian Christianity teaches. And so long before there were these movies uh, left behind by Tim LaHaye and other films uh, dealing with rapture and all those things, I believe that this film, A Thief in the Night, was the first Christian film uh, made public dealing with the subject of the rapture or the second coming of Christ. Regulation is running higher speaking. than some alien force and from so outside our system. And so I want you to take a look at this film. We're going to see, planet. Uh, and there will be no place to hide. The story hide, is about hide, the story hide, of a young woman who is left behind. Hide, hide, in the night. Hide, 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 it's quite funny. Now to the screen comes a powerful story of Bible prophecy. I know what's going on is evil, but I'm not going to join it. A thief of the night is coming from Mark Four Pictures in color. Please do not reveal the ending. I remember showing it to people, and even my kids saw it when they were young, and it made them uh, afraid of some of the things they saw. But because of the technology in the 70s, you know, the acting's not that good, and the... Uh, you know, the production is not that good. That's what makes the film very funny. So uh, you ought to check it out if you can. It may be found in other uh, sources. You don't have to buy it. You may find it online somewhere to take a look at. But let's see this clip. Speculation is running high that some alien force from outside our system has declared war on our planet. And there will be no place to hide. Hi, 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 hi. Hi, hi, a thief in the night. Hi, hi, hi. I wish we'd all been ready. Now to the screen comes a powerful story of Bible prophecy. I know what's going on is evil, but I'm not going to join it. A Thief in the Night is coming from Mark Four Pictures in color. Please do not reveal the ending.
Let's just, let us take a look at John Nelson Darby. Uh, John Nelson Darby was a Irish uh, preacher who lived between 1800 and 1882. Darby has been credited with originating the pre-tribulation rapture theory. Now, one thing we have to understand is that uh, about Christianity is this fact that in Christianity, men develop theories or doctrines and then they pull scriptures to try to build that doctrine or support that doctrine instead of allowing the scriptures to speak for themselves. And so Darby, who was, uh, who we're going to read this here. So let's check it out. It says Darby, the father of modern dispensationalism and futurism. So one thing you have to understand about the Christian uh, theological idea of dispensationalism is the teaching that during different time periods in the history of mankind, God dealt with men in different levels. And so in each one of these levels is called a dispensation. So in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, before Adam and Eve sinned, uh, the dispensationalists say that is the dispensation of innocence. And then after sin comes another dispensation. And then we get down to Noah and the flood, and there's another dispensation. And then we get to uh, Abraham, and there's another dispensation. Then we get to Israel coming out of Egypt. There's another dispensation, you know on and so on and so forth then finally we get to today and stemming back from the time of christ and so most christians will tell you we are in the dispensation of grace and so dispensationalism is not biblical according to the precepts but it is a doctrine of men that was created by men like john nelson darby so he's the father of modern dispensationalism and futurism futurism is the study of the end of things or the end times which pulls in rapture and tribulation and the kingdom that's coming and so on and so forth. And so Darby's credited with these things. The pre-tribulation rapture theory was popularized extensively in the 1830s by John Nelson Darby and the Plymouth Brethren and further popularized in the United States in the early 20th century by the wide circulation of the Schofield Reference Bible. Many of us, uh, or people we knew, older people probably had those Bibles, those King James Bibles that were printed and called the Schofield Reference, which were filled with Schofield's uh, commentary. Also, you have Thompson Chain Reference, which is another type of Bible. And so in these Bibles, instead of letting the scriptures be there alone, men began to, these Bible uh, groups began to put in uh, theology and doctrines and then give scriptures to support it. And so here comes the creation of, or the further advancing of the doctrine of the rapture. Okay, now a little bit about Darby. Darby was a former curate in the Church of Ireland. Curate means an assistant. He was a pastor, an evangelist, a minister, and he was an assistant to a high level bishop in the Church of Ireland in a certain region in which he lived. And so he was in ministry, but Darby had a problem with, uh, he had a problem as he began to evangelize and bring people to the church and what he thought bring people to Christ. Uh, he had a problem with the clergy. And so um, Darby resigned from his uh, office or work as a curate and in protest, he, uh, after resigning, he had a serious injury, fallen from a horse, and during this time, he began to search the scriptures, and this is from his own mouth, and he began to believe that the kingdom described in the book of Isaiah and elsewhere in the Old Testament was entirely different from the church of God, or excuse me, from the Christian church. And so he saw that, he saw that there was a difference between the kingdom of God and Christian church, okay? And so he developed... Uh, theology based on what he was uh, feeding himself in his own knowledge okay we never said that these things are from God we're just dealing with men so he developed the principles of his mature theology so Darby went through a process of maturing himself in the understanding of the theology that he was building in his own mind notably uh, his mature theology was concerning the clergy and this is why he left 
the Church of Ireland. Uh, he felt that the clergyman was a sin against the Holy Spirit. And so the reason being is because he felt that when you have clergy in place, and so there's a difference between the pastors and the elders and the members, that it limits the Holy Spirit from speaking through any member. So in order to get around that, he suggested or he developed with the Plymouth Brethren a church or a Christian operation in the church where there was no leadership of that nature um, when it came to the services. So everybody was on the equal floor and everybody could speak however they felt they were moved by the Holy Spirit, a move to teach. And so that's what he was into. Now, uh, from 1831 to 1833, uh, as Darby was moving forward, uh, he began to speak at uh, some renowned conferences in the U in Europe, and it's called the Power Powers Court Conference. And during this conference, during these years, was where Darby publicly began to describe his ecclesi ecclesiological and eschatological views. So he began to describe his view on how the church should be organized and how churches should be ran in that brethren system, and also uh, his views on the end of things and the end times and the coming of Christ and the rapture and tribulation. It says in the 1840s, he gave 11 lectures in Geneva on the hope of the church, dealing with the rapture and other doctrines about the end times. It says these lectures established his reputation as a leading interpreter of biblical prophecy. So during Darby's time from the mid 1800s down to until his death in 1882, he began to be known as a leading interpreter of biblical prophecy. Now you got to remember this man is a Gentile. All right. America didn't embrace his views on how the church system should be organized like the Brethren Church. But America did like his eschatology or his teaching on the end of things and the rapture and the tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so through his teaching and through uh, the Scope for Reference Bible and many people, this teaching has went around. It's global now. You can go on almost every continent and where there's Christians involved, you'll have churches meeting and people, you ask about the rapture, they're going to tell you what they believe. They're going to break down Darby's theory and they're going to tell you just like if it's the gospel or if it's the message that came out of heaven from God. So gospel means message. All right. So even to this day, uh, his views or his theory, his theology is still being embraced and pushed and propagated in many forms. And college campuses are called Christian seminaries, uh, Sunday preachers and teachers and churches. Uh, there are many uh, Christian pastors who made a lot of money writing books on the end times. You got authors like John Hagee and other authors, and they made many writing of books and made money. Uh, you got filmmakers like uh, Tim LaHaye, who wrote books called Left Behind and made a series out of that, and then it went into filmmaking. And so on this rapture teaching or rapture doctrine, uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars have been made on this, but we want to still find out. Was Darby hearing the truth, or was this Gentile fiction? In other words, is this concept that Jesus is going to come and Christians will get up, whether they be dead or living, and fly out of here and planes will fall from the sky. And, you know, so over the years. So uh, this rapture theology, remember, we pulled a scripture from we pulled the uh, question from Billy Graham's Web page about what is the rapture. And so a lot of times when Christianity or Christian pastors or preachers uh, begin to talk about the Bible, they love the letters of Paul. And they use Paul's letters to try to build their case on their doctrine. So they're building their case on their doctrine based on their understanding of the letters of Paul. Now, uh, this is how the rapture doctrine has been developed. And so here's a few of the scriptures they like to use. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2. Uh, it says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And that's where we got that film title, Thief in the Night, like, Christ is coming back to rapture the church. Nobody knows when. He's going to come as a thief. 
they pulled that scripture to support that idea. Uh, this is where Graham picked up his rapture teaching um, on his explanation. He used 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 17. I'm only pulling two of those verses. And it says, um, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the dead in Christ, the dead Christians will get up first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the Christian theology says that this, this catching up of the dead in Christ and the living in Christ together in the air with the Lord is called the rapture. Now you have to understand that who was Paul writing to? Okay, was Paul writing to Gentiles or the children of Japheth? Or was he writing his, or was his teachings based upon the law and the prophets? Okay, and was he writing to Israel? Okay, now, also another one of Paul's letters in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, Paul speaks of an event that happened, and, and this is significant. He says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, in the flesh, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And so Paul is describing something that happened, and he's using a different way of describing it in his language and presentation. He's not being arrogant, and he's talking about something that happened of being in his hymn, being caught up into the third heaven. Now, was Paul raptured? Was Paul physically translated from the earth into the heaven and saw things that no man could see and, and heard things that no man should hear? Was John on the Isle of Patmos raptured into the heavens and saw things that no man could see and wrote things that no man could hear? You know, was that a physical thing? Was that a rapture? Did he go to heaven and then come back to the earth? Okay, and so uh, Christians pull these letters from Paul. They pull verses, uh, what they call in context, but, you know, it's got to be precept, not on your reasoning called context, okay? It has to be precept, and there is a method that God put in the scriptures. And so Christians pull Paul's letters, and they create doctrines. Now, we have a warning from Brother Peter concerning this of these acts. Uh, Peter tells us, speaking of Paul, it says, also in, as also in all his epistles, Paul's epistles, Paul is speaking in them these things which are some things hard to be understood. And the reason they're hard to be understood because if you don't understand the law, you won't understand what Paul is saying. Paul says, I speak to them that know the law. You can find that in the book of Romans. I believe it's Romans chapter 7. Okay? So when Paul is writing, he's writing to people who have a foundation in the law and the prophets. And he's speaking to Israel, Israelite people. He's not speaking to uh, the children of Japheth, who are the Gentiles sent to the isles of the Gentiles. Okay? And so Paul is speaking to them that know the law. I'm going to show you that in Romans 7.1. He says, know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. All right. So he's speaking to people who are familiar with the five books called the books of Moses and the prophets, which Yahweh said Jesus Christ also taught out of. OK, now, Peter says that people take Paul's writings and in them, there are things hard to be understood because they don't understand precepts. It says which they that are unlearned, unlearned in what? The precepts. And unstable in what? The precepts and in the knowledge of God rest or they wrestle as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. So when you take scriptures and make a doctrine and theology based on your reasoning, it's not of God. And so this is what uh, these people have done when they took the letters of Paul and created these doctrines. So Peter gives us a, a sound warning. If you don't understand the law, stay out of Paul's books, okay? But you notice the majority of Christianity never teaches 
The preachers never go back into the old. They only visit the Old Testament talking about uh, Abraham a little bit and maybe Adam and Eve and, Mo, and, and, and a few things about coming out of Egypt. They don't go into the deep things of the precepts of the law. Okay, so Peter gives us an ample warning in 2 Peter 3, 16. If you don't understand the precepts and this word ain't written to you, stay away from it. Stay out of it because you're going to wrestle to your own destruction. Okay, and that's what we have when we get these certain doctrines. And so this is how the doctrine of the rapture has been created through taking scriptures from here and there and using these scriptures to fit a theology that was formed in the mind of a man called John Nelson Darby. All right. Also, um, remember, they said the rapture will be secret. And where they get this from is Mark 13, 32. This is one example. It says, but the day, but that day and that hour knoweth no man, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the son, but the father. And so only. Now, seeing that the word rapture is not in the Bible, um, but, you know, the, in the Christian church, they'll tell you the word is not there, but the event is talked about in the scriptures. But we're going to deal with the word rapture. Seeing that the word rapture is not in the Bible, we got to find out where did it come from. And so, uh, Yahweh Shire, Jesus, warned us of some things. And he tells us in Matthew 24, verse 4, And Yahweh Shire answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. In other words, you got to be very careful of who you learn from and what you learn and make sure no one is deceiving you. And so since the word rapture is not in the dictionary, but we have movies like Left Behind that promote this rapture doctrine, we got to find out what does this word rapture mean and where did it come from? So on this slide, uh, you'll see uh, from Etymology Online, which is dealing with the English word or dealing with word origin, we see that the word rapture has an origin in 1600. It means the act of carrying off. And it is derived from Middle French word rapture and, that, and from medieval Latin raptura, which means seizure, rape, kidnapping. So rapture means the act of carrying off, seizure, rape, kidnapping which comes from the Latin raptus, a carrying off, abduction, snatching away, and rape. Okay, it says, earliest attested use in English is of women in the uh, 17th century. It is sometimes meant rape. Okay, so now, that's the definition or the etymology of the word rapture. So when you see the word rapture, by definition of the word, since the word is not biblical, we must see it means to carry off, to kidnap, to abduct, away, to rape. Okay? So do you think the Most High is going to kidnap, abduct, carry away, and rape uh, people? So now I want to take a look, and I want us to take a look at some scriptures that uh, many times are being used in church to, uh, in Christianity to push the rapture doctrine and, and the theory of the rapture. And you have a whole lot of people believing in the rapture based on the misapplication of these verses. And so we're going to pick up in Matthew 24, verse 40, and we're going to read. It says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Matthew 24, 41. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now you have to understand, like the left behind movie. In the movie or in the idea of Christianity, to be taken is to be raptured and to be left is to be left in tribulation. Okay? And we want to, so are these scriptures actually saying that? We got to understand what does it mean to be taken or took, okay? Now, Matthew 24, 38 says, As for in the days that were before the flood, they were eating 
and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Okay, so until the time where Noah entered into the ark, and that's a whole nother doctrine. If you believe that a big boat sailed around the world, uh, you got to check your theology because theology is not of God. The precepts don't teach that, but that's a whole nother teaching. Okay, so during the days of Noah, when evil and violence and wickedness was flowing upon the earth, okay, until the day when Noah entered to the ark, the ark is the heart of God. It is the place of safety. It is the truth, okay? It says in verse 39, Matthew 24, 39, and knew not. So the people around Noah didn't know what was coming. Like in the rapture, nobody knows the day nor the hour, right? And it says, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall be the coming of the so shall be the coming of the Son of Man be. So Yahweh said, Christ is saying that as it was in the days of Noah, when Noah entered into that safe place, into the heart of God, into obedience, into faith, into truth, into the righteous covenant of the Most High, and the other people were staying in their sins and following false doctrines, following false teachings, following all these things, following the flesh. They didn't know all Noah's preaching. They rejected. They didn't know until the flood came. The flood of deception came. And what happened when the flood came? It took them all away. So if to be taken means to be raptured, did all these people get raptured away? In the days of Noah, who was taken? Them were taken. In other words, when you study the scriptures in the days of Noah, those people caught in the flood, and we'll have to deal with the flood in another day. If you want to know what the flood is, come check out KJBU, King James Bible University. You'll find teachings on Noah on the main page, King James Bible University, all right, on the Elder Michael Johnson. So they didn't know until the flood came. So when these people got caught in this flood, it says, and it took them. The word took them doesn't apply to Noah. Remember, Noah was left behind on a, on, in the ark. The them were the people. It took them all away. So what happened to those people in the flood? Did they go to heaven? Did they go be raptured to be taken if it means to be raptured? Of course not. They died. And that's what we're looking at. When you look at the in the Bible, the word to be taken or to, or took, it means to die. So we see when we deal with the word taken or took, um, we have a conflict of interest, a conflict in doctrine right on the first page. Uh, when we looked at Matthew uh, 24, verse uh, 41 speaks of two women grinding at the mill. One shall be taken, one the other left. And we were thinking, and many of us were thinking through Christianity that to be taken means to be raptured. When you get down to uh, Matthew 24, verse 39, remember the flood came and Noah was left. And Noah was a righteous man who found grace in the eyes of God. And the other people were took. So there's a conflict right there. And you got to check this thing out. We got to work it out. Now, let's get to this slide here. We're going to deal with, still dealing with the word took and taken. And you, by now, hopefully you understand that to be took or taken does not mean to be raptured. And remember, raptured means to be carried away, captive, raped, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, we'll get back to that slide in the future. Now, we're going to look at the word taken. And we're going to go to 2 Ezra chapter 1, excuse me, 2 Ezra chapter 5, verse 1. This is in the book of the Apocrypha, which is a part of the King James Bible 1611. So if you don't have a King James Bible 1611, uh, you'll have to get an Apocrypha. You can buy it separately, or you can go and get you a Cambridge Bible that contains all of it. All right, so remember, in the beginning, the Apocrypha was a part of the Scriptures but Gentiles pulled it out for a reason. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about being taken. 
So we're in 2nd Ezra, so 2nd Ezra is 5.1. And it reads, Nevertheless, as coming the tokens, behold, the days shall come, or remember, the days shall come, that they which dwell upon the earth shall be taken in a great number, and the way of truth shall be hidden, and the land shall be barren of faith. Now, according to the rapture philosophy, the rapture Christian mind would say, yeah, this is this is what it means. OK, uh, the Ezra and Ezra is also Ezra, same man. All right. OK, now he says. Remember. He's speaking of a future time. Days shall come when they which dwell upon the earth shall be taken in great number. So is so is this speaking of a great number of people being raptured into heaven? All right. And the way of truth shall be hidden, and the land shall be barren of faith. Now, Ezra is speaking of Israel. They shall be taken away in great number. And the way of truth, who has the truth? Israel had the truth. All right. You go to uh, Psalms 147, 19 and 20. And I'm not going to read that right now, but you can go there and check it out. Who has the truth? Okay. And uh, it says the land, the land, Jerusalem, and the land, the people from Jerusalem shall be barren of faith. So that's what that means. Now, I have a little note here. It says Christians love to use Enoch as a case study for the rapture doctrine. So we're going to take a look at Enoch and we're going to try to understand what what is this case about Enoch. All right. Now, remember, Enoch is of the line of Seth and Enoch is related to Noah. And so let's take a look here. Genesis 524 It says, and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And so in the mind of the rapture theologian, he will say, see, Enoch was raptured. And I'm sure many of you heard uh, when it talks about the two witnesses coming back, you know, in Christianity, some will say, well, it's, it's Moses and Elijah. Or some will say it's Enoch and Elijah because God raptured Enoch and nobody know what happened to Enoch. And so people literally believe that Enoch left this world alive in the flesh and went into heaven. But is this what the scripture is saying? Now, the scripture says Enoch walked with God. So you got to understand. Also, the Bible tells us that they that in the flesh cannot please God. So is Enoch's walk physical or is Enoch walking in the spirit? Is he walking with God in the flesh or is he walking with God according to uh, the, the law and according to the commandments that God had given Adam? In the beginning, you know, so how is he walking with God? So it says Enoch walked with God and he was not. And we got to find out what that, what does that mean? For God took him. So Enoch was not and God took him. Let's go to Hebrews chapter number 11, verse five. And it says by faith. So we got to understand Enoch by faith. Enoch by faith was translated. So was not means to be translated okay by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him colon new thought for before his translation before his translation Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. So how did Enoch walk with God? He was pleasing to God. Okay. So we're going to find out what does this mean? By faith, he was translated that he should not see death. So according to the rapture Christian doctrine, people actually believe that Enoch was taken from the earth by God into heaven, that Enoch didn't die and Enoch is in heaven like he was in the earth. And, and, and that's what happened to him. Enoch was raptured. 
But we have to understand there's a there's a principle in the Bible and it says it is appointed once for man to die, then judgment. Death passed on from Adam unto all men. So did death bypass Enoch? Hmm? If all in Adam died, wasn't Enoch from Adam? So is this saying that death bypassed Enoch, that he should not see death, physical death? You must understand in the Bible, there are two deaths. There's the death of the flesh, which all flesh shall die. And then there's the second death, which means eternal damnation in fire, in brimstone, in hell, in the lake of fire. So when you understand that there's two deaths, Enoch was taken that he should not see the second death. And we're going to prove that. It doesn't mean Enoch left the earth as a man and his fleshly body went into heaven. Because if Enoch is in heaven, that makes the Bible a lie. And those who preach that or teach that Enoch is in heaven, raptured or lying. And we're going to prove that in just a moment. Why did God take Enoch? So first of all, before as we get into this and we need to kind of examine the Enoch and dealing with the rapture, uh, you have to understand the function of the name Enoch. Enoch name means dedicated. Okay. Okay. So... He was a man who followed God. He was dedicated to God. And so in the book of 2 Ezra chapter 6, verse 48 and 49, I didn't put it on the screen, but I'll read it in your hearing. It says, For the dumb water and without life brought forth living things at the commandment of God, that all people might praise thy wonderful works. Then didst thou ordain two living creatures, the one thou callest Enoch and the other Leviathan. And so life, men came out of these dumb waters. And so God is describing a type ology called Enoch, like Enoch. So Enoch means dedicated. Okay, we understand according to the Bible in Genesis that Enoch didn't start following God until he was 65 years old and he followed God for 300 years and so during this time of him following God he had a testimony that he pleased God and so we we're going to understand why did God take him okay and so in order to do that because remember the scripture says God took him for he was not or Enoch was not for God took him and so we're going to kind of deal with Enoch again, where we left off in the previous slide. And we're going to kind of examine this precept about Enoch. And it's going to help us understand this doctrine. Okay. So in the wisdom of Solomon, which is also found in the Apocrypha chapter 4, verse 7, it says, but though the righteous be for, pre, excuse me, but though the righteous be prevented with death, Yet shall he be in rest. Okay. So, but though the righteous be prevented with death, yet shall he be in rest. So remember, Enoch was found to be a faithful and dedicated righteous man following the commandments of God. He, he, he followed God to the point whereby he had fulfilled what was necessary for him to receive eternal life and so during that time frame so here we go Enoch being righteous died so when God took him we're going to discover that he died and the reason God took him in death was that if he died in a perfect state or as a full man in a perfect state spiritually then he would be at rest with God. If he dies in a corrupted state, carnally, then he will receive damnation. So that's what we're picking up in Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 7. 
Now, in the book of the wisdom of Solomon, Solomon is speaking of a man. He doesn't use the name, but he uses the precepts to describe Enoch. All right, we're going to jump down to wisdom of Solomon, verse, chapter 4, verse 10. It says, he pleased God. And who pleased God? We know the Bible tells us Enoch did. He pleased God and was beloved of him so that living among sinners, he was translated. Taking into account what Solomon told us in verse 7 of chapter 4, Wisdom of Solomon 4, 7, that Enoch being righteous was prevented with death that he shall be at rest. We see here that Enoch is pleasing God. Enoch was beloved of the Most High. And Enoch was living among sinners. Enoch was living in a world that was being corruptible and more corrupt and more corruptible. And therefore, God translated him. God took him away. God ended his fleshly life that he may take a perfect soul with him. That's what happened. And we're going to prove that. Let's keep reading. Yea, speedily or quickly was he taken away. Quickly, Enoch was taken away. The reason why God took Enoch in death, death is a, how can I put this? Death is a uh, vehicle that takes you from this fleshly world to eternity. Now, in eternity, you will either be with God or you will be in condemnation. All right? Only the righteous will see God. And so we have to understand to be righteous, you got to be found in the covenant of God, keeping the commandment and faith of God and faith of Christ. So, yea, speedily he was taken away. He was raptured away. No, yea, speedily he died, lest that wickedness should alter his understanding or deceit beguile his soul. God took Enoch out of the earth at 365. He, remember, everybody was living a whole lot longer than him. So he only lived a short time in that time of his life. But for those 300 years, Enoch was able to perfect his spiritual walk with God. And so God took him, lest being corrupted by the wickedness that was surrounding him, that his heart and his mind will be cor corrupted and his understanding will be corrupted. He will fall from the truth that was trying to beguile his soul. God took him. And this is the reason why. Verse 12. For the bewitching of naughtiness doth obscure things that are honest, and the wandering of concupiscence doth undermine the simple-minded. So, because there was a desire in Enoch probably, or because there was a desire in Enoch to want, to want things, or there was a wanting of things in his life, that want of things that maybe sometimes the flesh will present to him, was raging war against his mind. So Enoch living in a world of sin and him being righteous, he, he, he was in a constant battle. There was a constant war of righteousness against unrighteousness. And so the want of certain things was undermining Enoch's mind. He was becoming weakened. Okay? Verse 13. He, Enoch, being made perfect in a short time. What's a short time? From 65 years to 365 years. Enoch, he being made perfect in a short time, fulfilled a long time. So Enoch, fulfilling the requirements to make it in the kingdom of God and be with the Most High, it took him a short time in his life to get it right compared to others. And so God took him. Verse 14. For his soul, Enoch's soul, pleased the Lord Therefore hasted he, hasted the Lord to take him away from among the wicked. So Enoch was taken away from among the wicked through death that his soul and his spirit might be with God in righteousness because Enoch had fulfilled what was necessary to obtain eternal life in that period. In his faith walk with God, in pleasing God. Remember, they that are in the flesh, they that operate according to the lust of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, cannot please God. Enoch wasn't operating in that way. Enoch was operating and moving in the faith of God by his spirit, by the spirit of God that was upon him, leading him teaching him, walking in the precepts and the commandments of God. 
So that's how Enoch was able to please God. For his soul pleased the Most High. Therefore, the Most High hated to remove him from among the wicked. He had to take his, he had to take this fleshly life from him. Remember, the flesh shall die. It's appointed for flesh to die. Enoch had to die in the flesh that his spirit might be eternally be with God. And finally, in Wisdom of Solomon 417, thus the righteous Enoch that is dead shall condemn the ungodly which are living. Enoch died in righteousness. Therefore, that's what it means he was translated. Okay. Thus the righteous that is dead shall condemn the ungodly which are living and the youth that is soon perfected the many years and the old age of unrighteousness. Let me read that again. Thus the righteous that is dead, Enoch, shall condemn the ungodly which are living, those, pe those sinners living when he was living, and the youth that is soon perfected. Enoch was young. He didn't live. Remember, Methuselah lived a long time. Noah lived 600 years. And the youth that is soon perfected, Enoch was perfected in his life from the year three, year 65 to year 365. He was perfected in a short time that his soul was right with God. An old age of unrighteousness. So he was perfected in his youth. So he didn't see an old age of unrighteousness. Many unrighteous people are living a long time because God's given them a chance to get things right. All right. So let's. We see that Enoch was translated. In other words, Enoch died in faith and obedience to Christ. Sirach 44, verse 16. Enoch pleased the Lord and was translated. He died. Being an example of remembrance, repentance means remembrance to all generations. To generations of who? The Israelites. Okay? He's of that same type of seed. That same type of person. Okay? Now, if we pick up in Hebrews 11.5, it says, By faith, Enoch, the dedicated one, uh, died, was translated, that he should not see death, the second death, eternal fire, condemnation, judgment, hellfire, lake of fire. And was not found, he didn't end up in that place, because God had translated him. God allowed him to die in this flesh. And before his death, Enoch, the dedicated one, had this testimony that he pleased God. Why? He, remember, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He pleased God while in this physical body because he walked after the spirit. And not after the flesh. He didn't fill his life full of. Or he conquered the flesh. He conquered the works of the flesh. That are found in Galatians 5. Uh, 19 through 21. Those things weren't found in him. And while him living among sinners. They were raging war. And it was a war against his soul. And he may have been getting weakened. God took him so that he could preserve his life. In eternity. So Pastor C. Roach. And Evangelist Hamhock would tell you. Be rapture ready. That's what they tell us in the Christian church. All right. And you hear the preacher say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. And they're saying, get ready to you, brother and sister, because they don't want you to be left behind and miss Jesus. Now, what they're really saying is, is deception. All right. You're getting ready to be caught up. To be separate from the truth. That you may meet. A Jesus who's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Cesar Borgia image is the Antichrist spirit. It's not the spirit of Christ. Okay. So this rapture doctrine didn't come from Christ. It didn't come from the scriptures. It came from a Gentile. And we talked about him. And that's uh, J. Nelson Darby. He was a pure Gentile. He was of Japhet. There is no covenant between God and Japhet. And so he came up with his doctrine. And so this doctrine to have you looking for something that the Bible does not teach and it'll have you believing a lie. And if you believe a lie and not the truth, what comes with believing a lie? Condemnation or damnation. Also, uh, Patty Portrine in the video, remember, 
This, the, the lady was left behind. Her name is Patty, so I called her Patty Pork Ryan. In that little clip about the movie Thief in the Night, Patty Pork, Patty Pork Ryan was in a pickle because she missed out on the rapture and was left behind. So we got to deal with this left behind subject now because uh, we already killed the fact that to be taken doesn't mean to be raptured up into the sky. All right. It means you're going to die. OK. All right, let us continue. Left behind. Remember, uh, the rapture theorists produce movies like Left Behind by a uh, person named Tim LaHaye, the Christian writer and pastor. And so you remember in the Christian films and in the rapture theology, if you're left behind, you're cursed and you're doomed and etc. Now, to be left behind is going to be a test. Remember, everything that goes into the kingdom has to go through the fire. So those that are left behind, we're going to have to go through the fire, the fiery trials, okay? Now, let's deal with this left behind subject based on precepts and not based upon Christian theology, which is the doctrine of men. In the book of 2nd Ezra, chapter 13, we're going to be reading some verses uh, from verse 15 to 19 and then I'll pick up from there. All right. So let us begin second Ezra chapter 13 verse 15. Show me the interpretation of this dream. So Ezra's had a dream and is pointed out in the same chapter verse 1 and in the dream from verse 1 down to verse 14 he saw some very dreadful things in the dream and remember God speaks to his prophets through dreams, through visions, through similitude through allegories, through dark speeches, through parable. So he's trying to understand this dream. Like Daniel could interpret dreams, Ezra needs somebody to help him interpret what, uh, understand what God is saying. So we get to verse 15 and he's speaking to the messenger and he says, show me the interpretation of this dream that he's puzzled, he's thinking on that has him perplexed, has him amazed, all right? And so now as Ezra is thinking on this dream, we get to verse 16. For as I conceived in my understanding or in my mind and my thoughts, woe unto them that shall be left. Woe means destruction, turmoil, peril, uh, death at times. Woe unto them that shall be left in those days, in the last days. And much more woe unto them that shall not be, that shall not be left behind. Okay. Woe to those that shall be left in the last days and much more woe or anguish and trouble and destruction to them that are not left behind. So in other words, Ezra says, I understand that there's more trouble, even though those that are left have trouble, there's a whole lot more trouble coming to those that are taken, those that are not left behind. He says much more woe, much more destruction. Why, why is there much more woe? Because when they died, they died without finishing their works. They didn't have works toward the Almighty. They died in the flesh. They died living a carnal life. And so the end result of sin, flesh, life in the flesh, is judgment, is condemnation, is a lake of fire. Okay? Let's keep reading. Second Ezra 13, 17. For they that were not left were in heaviness. Why? Because they that were taken died, many of them who died unfit and unready. And most, and honestly, brothers, these are Israelites he's talking about. Because the covenant is with Israel. All right. They that were not left were in heaviness. Why? Because they died outside of the covenant. And so they knew what was coming. See, remember, when you die, then comes judgment. Verse 18. Now, understand I the things that are laid up in the latter days. So, he, as you're saying, I understand what's going to happen in the days down the road, the latter days. Which will happen unto them and to those that are left behind. So, as you're saying, I understand what's going to happen in the latter days to them that are taken or to them who died. Okay. Some in the faith, some out of the faith. And uh, to those who are left behind, who are living. 
Therefore are they come into great perils. Perils means dangers and testings and many necessities, like as the dream declare. So Ezra is saying what he knows to the messenger. I know that those that are left behind are going to go through great tribulation and many necessities. It's going to be hard, hard, hard times. The easy walk is over. All right. Remember when Jerusalem was taken by, besieged by the Romans, it was hard times, man. It wasn't easy. And Christ prophesied about what's coming. And he talked about the siege of Jerusalem. That was a hard time, brother. When the Greeks came and took Judah, that was a hard time. Antiochus, you go read the first, second Maccabees. Those were hard times, bro. My friend, peril. Okay? Now, the angels are going to give the interpretation. I'm picking up in 2 Ezra 13, 22 to 23. And let's read. Whereas thou hast spoken of them that are left behind, this is the, inter this is the interpretation. All right? He's about to explain to us what the left behind people are doing. When we're dealing with Israel, we're not dealing with Gentile minds right now. He that shall endure the peril, the danger, in that time hath kept himself. So those who are enduring the test and keeping the faith and keeping the covenant and are working out their salvation with fear and trembling, overcoming the flesh, putting death the deeds of the body, they will endure the, the danger and they're keeping themselves for Christ. How? Let's keep reading. They that be fallen into danger, that's another term for those that are left behind, as such as have works and faith toward the Almighty. So those who are keeping themselves in the truth have works and faith. Now the Christian church would tell you just believe. No, you can't just believe because James already told us, show me your works without your faith and I'll show you my works by my faith. So works and faith go hand in hand. Now, most of the time when people think of works, you're thinking of physical activity. You're thinking of, let me feed the homeless. Let me paint some, wash somebody's car. Let me give some money to the church. Those are not the works he's talking about. We're talking about works of righteousness, works that are spiritual, works that are holy, the works of the spirit. Now, remember, there are works of the flesh. So those that were taken were exhibiting the works of the flesh. Those works of the flesh that are found in Galatians 5, 19 to 21 are not toward the almighty. They are against God. So if we're found in those books with those works in our lives, we're going to die. Okay. But if we're left behind, we have an opportunity. We have to keep working on our salvation until salvation shows up for us. And so in order to do so, we have to have works after the spirit. Remember, they that are led of the spirit of Christ or of the spirit of God are the sons of God. As many as receive him, receive Christ, the spirit, the word, the seed of God, the spirit, the truth. As many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And so those are works. And as we become sons of God by walking in the truth and in the faith of our covenant with our heavenly father, as our forefathers did, and as Christ showed us in the flesh, that we live the life Christ lived in the flesh, as Yahweh Shai lived in the flesh, salvation demonstrated to us in the flesh, then we will have works and faith toward the Almighty. And so this is what is happening to those that are left behind. They have to be producing these works. And we're talking about Israelites. All right. Second Ezra 13, 24. Know this, therefore, that they which be left behind are more blessed than they that be dead. So the woes, those that are much more woe are dead, meaning the second death. Those that are left behind are blessed. Why? They have more understanding, more knowledge of the Most High, and they're producing the fruit 
and the thing that the Most High want us to produce that we may be children of righteousness and not children of the flesh. Okay? And so to be left behind is not like in the rapture movies. Yes, it's going to be dangerous, but in your left behind state, you're in a better state being left behind, my Israelite brother and sister, and working out your salvation than to die in your sins. So to be left behind in great peril, great tribulation, great trouble is a blessing because you're working to kill that flesh that your spirit and my spirit, like Enoch's spirit, may be found perfect before God. And so Ezra is telling us that it is more blessed to be left behind than to be dead and get the second death. And so you can make that understanding. You can come to that conclusion that what left behind is, according to the scriptures, is not the same thing as what left behind is, according to Christian. The spirit is about to take you into realms and dimensions you've never been before. Some of you, you've heard about heaven and you desire to go to heaven. But within these 30 days, if you follow the instructions of the spirit, some of you will have an encounter to go to heaven. You won't die, but you go to heaven and see heaven and come back. I went there for one hour 45 minutes. I was taken out of my body to heaven. One hour 45 minutes. And I saw some very interesting things. And one of the things I saw, an angel took me to a high mountain. The grass was like diamonds. Green grass shine like diamonds. And why is I was standing there? Interesting scenario. And it's not everything I talk about. One of the fathers that brought me up in prayer. At the church of Pentecost, Elder Saki. The angel said to me, Do you know anybody here? And I said, Yes, Elder Saki. And he drove on that beautiful grass and came to see me. And he mentioned my first name. And I said, Papa. And he gave me a pass to go back to my body. And he was driving a beautiful, beautiful white car that shined like diamonds. And apparently that was his dream car when he was on earth. He didn't have it when he was on earth. He had it in heaven. And I said, but how can Papa be driving a car in heaven? Heaven? And the angel said, he read my thought. The angels knew my thought. And the angel said, have you not read, have you not been told that the streets of heaven is made out of gold? What is streets made for? Then I got it. But then he showed me a beautiful city. And he said, that is the city of T.L. Osborne. And I said, T.L. Osborne, that is my grandfather in the faith. Then I came back to my body. I was staying in Maryland. I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma to visit my, kids, my children at OIU. On my way back to Tulsa, I came through Houston. Then the spirit said, change your ticket, go through Chicago. So I called my daughter and I said, Elsie. Here we go. All right. Now, there's some interesting things that he said in that video we need to pay close attention to. Uh, quite a few things. He told the people starting out that if they want to, uh, within 30 days, I guess this was some type of conference, if they follow the things that he's going to tell them about and teach them that in 30 days they could have the same encounter and go up into heaven and you can see how people would lust after that type of testimony because it would give you some type of influence that you were some kind of great man or woman of God, so to speak. Also, he said that when he went to heaven, uh, he was there for an hour and 45 minutes. And we understand, according to the scriptures and the precepts, that God is eternal. And so the things of the kingdom and of heaven are eternal. Time does not exist there. Uh, another point was that when he got there, the angel asked him a question and about, did he know anybody there? And he stated the name of one of his mentors when he was a youth from the church of Pentecost, which is a Christian organization in Ghana and in Nigeria. And so, uh, how would he know that that particular elder would be in heaven because God is the one who 
determines the destiny of souls of men. Secondly, he um, the the man appeared on uh, grass. So he says, "There's grass in heaven, and the grass is like diamond." And the man appeared in a car, and there's cars in heaven. And it blew his mind that he saw this man who was poor on the earth driving a great car in heaven. So what you don't get in this life, in the flesh, he's saying that in the heaven, in heaven you'll be able to have nice cars and flashy things of that nature. Secondly, I mean, uh, let me not secondly, but let's continue. Also, uh, when he questioned the angel about a car in heaven, the angel told him, aren't there streets in heaven? And streets of gold, so what are cars made, what are streets made for? All right, so he's taking things literally. Another thing was that he said that the angel showed him a city. And when he saw the city of gold, he asked the angel, uh, to whom was this city for? And the angel told him it was for T.L. Osborne. And so uh, he came back to himself and he began to talk about he began to say to the angel that T.L. Osborne was his father in the faith. We're talking about charismatic movement type of thing. And so he comes back to earth and he goes to, he comes back to himself and he goes on a trip and he's flying from place to place and he ends up in Chicago and he finds T.L. Osborne in, in uh, Starbucks. Okay. I cut video because there's so many other things in that video. It's kind of crazy. All right. It's not sound doctrine. But uh, according, but according to his testimony, uh, this man T.L. Osborne has a city made of gold in the heavens by God. Now, one thing you want to understand, I had to look up who was T.L. Osborne. And T.L. Osborne was a bona fide Japhetic man. He's a bona fide Gentile from, the tri from Japhet. So uh, does Japhet have a, co a covenant with the Most High? All right. Those who were uh, banished to the Isles of the Gentiles in Genesis chapter 10, do they have a covenant with God? I don't think so. And so that's another error in his uh, presentation. But when we talk about the, the rapture doctrine of men being caught up into heaven, this kind of ties along with it. So you notice that this particular Christian pastor is actually telling lies. Now, Paul addressed that in Titus chapter 1, verse 12. And so he talked about Cretans. Cretan is a derivative of from where we get the word Christian. Uh, you've been lied to when they tell you Christian means Christ-like. It does not. The original uh, etymology of the word Christian comes from Cretan. Christian was an insult, okay? Uh, they were called Christians at Antioch, who called the, who called the disciples Christians. It wasn't people who were fond of the truth. It was the heathen, and they were insulting them, calling them Cretans or liars. And so Titus 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 12 says, Of themselves, of these particular people, even a prophet of their own said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. And so we understand that <clears throat> this man is telling lies. He cannot substantiate what he's saying and he never once opened the Bible to give them any precepts and so the people are being caught up into a story and they're taking the hook, line, and sinker, okay? And it's like you get put into a position of being idolized, so to speak. And, and so I don't know his motives, but I'm telling you according to the precepts, that story is error. Also in Titus chapter 1, picking up at verse 10, it says, for there are many, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. He's talking about the Cretans, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And we know that in these conferences, I'm not saying that's his own motive, but in these conferences, a lot of money is passed. And so the Bible tells us that lying prophets and Cretans do these such things. They teach for uh, profit and so on and so forth to make that money. 
Now, speaking of the fact that when he talked about he was he ascended into the heavens, we got to pick up in St. John chapter 3, verse 13. And in that verse, it says, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So do you have to understand what this what Christ is saying, Jesus is saying, and the Spirit of Christ is declaring through the man Jesus to us. All right? No man hath went up into heaven. Never. No man. Enoch didn't go into heaven. Elijah didn't go into heaven. Moses didn't go into heaven. David didn't go into heaven. All these men died and were buried. All right? Their spirit, God reserved because they were faithful men, but they didn't go to heaven. They were awaiting salvation to come. Okay? Now, no man hath ascended up into heaven. So what descended? What came down from heaven? In the book, in the Gospels, we see that at the baptism of Christ, or at the baptism of Yahawashai, John saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove upon Yahawashai. So what came down from heaven was the Word, the seed, the Spirit of the Word, which is the Spirit of Christ, and it came and it moved upon and empowered the man Yahawashai who's known as Jesus okay so there is no man going up into heaven and at the same time in John 3 13 when Jesus is saying this he says the son of man which is in heaven so he's not talking about flesh and blood because remember flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God we find out that in 1 Corinthians 15 50 so when he says the son of man which is in heaven he's talking about the spirit of Christ which God sent to prepare his people for salvation, okay? The son of man means the servant of man, which is in heaven. So the same Jesus who's talking on the earth, is he in heaven while he's speaking? No, but the spirit of Christ, the word, the seed of the word is in heaven, all right? Now let's move on. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, Neither do corruption and inherit in corruption. So no corruptible flesh is going to go into the heavens and dwell uh, beyond the veil, so to speak. Uh, no flesh is going to go into the holy place. All right. No flesh and blood can get there. Now, even though this man was teaching and, and, and declaring his testimony, this preacher, let us hear what Paul admonished Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. He tells Timothy, when speaking to the people, speaking to Israel, the people of God, the people of covenant, he says, preach the word. Well, what does that mean? That means proclaim the precepts. You notice the man never had the Bible open at all. He's just telling a story. All right. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they, Israel, will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And so, can you imagine sitting in that audience? You're not hearing sound doctrine. You're not hearing the word. You're, not, you're hearing preaching. You're hearing sermons. You're not hearing precept on precept, line up on line. The Bible is not being opened. So what's going into your ear, what's going into your spirit is not from the spirit of God. You're receiving the doctrine of men. All right. You're receiving the philosophies of men, which cannot be substantiated by the Bible. And so as these people listen to that, they're getting itching ears because they want to have the same testimony. Because can you imagine if you went to heaven, you can tell people, man, I've been to heaven. All right. Now, at the same time, think about it. If you were caught up into heaven, why would you want to come back to the earth? Okay. And so in giving this message, it is turning the way the ears of the hearer from the truth and they will believe fables or lies and they won't hear this truth. And so that's the danger of following the spirit of the Cretan. Okay. Remember, we started this journey about the rapture. And the question was, is it biblical or is it Gentile fiction? Now, in the rapture, uh, the doctrine of the rapture, which came from 
uh, one of the great pushers of that doctrine, uh, Mr. Darby there, and the Schofield Bible and others, it says that according to like Billy Graham, the Christian will be caught up to meet Jesus in the sky where the dead are alive and nobody will know when it's going to happen and planes are going to be falling from the sky and there'll be chaos in the earth and all these things are going to happen. And you have men talking about they were caught up into heaven, putting themselves on the level of Paul, not understanding what Paul was declaring when he said it. Okay, so remember, heaven is a spiritual place. God is a spirit and this is a spiritual thing. And so no flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom of God. So we have hopefully brought you to an understanding that as the Christian church presents the rapture theory, it is a theory, it is a philosophy of, philosophy of men, and it is a false doctrine and it will lead you into heresy because it will cause you to miss the truth. You cannot mix oil and water. So when it comes to the understanding of the Christian rapture teaching or doctrine that's so prominent in the earth, we have come to a conclusion that Enoch didn't go into heaven. Enoch died. Okay. Those that are left behind are blessed. All right. So when Christ said that, Two shall be in a field, one shall be taken and one shall be left. We came to understand that the one taken will die. And if they die without their um, house in order, they're going to get the second death, which is condemnation. And we found out that Enoch did die the first death, that his soul may be preserved, that he would not see the second death nor be corrupted. Also, we found out that the left behind is in, is in a blessed place, even though it's going to be great tribulation and trouble and turmoil uh, as the latter times press on. Those who are left still have an opportunity among Israel to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. All right. So the Christian doctrine that uh, Jesus, who they believe is uh, this European looking man, Caesar Borgia, will come on a cloud and uh, the living in the dead Christian. And you got to remember Christianity has uh, 45,000 denominations and all kinds of different doctrines. So uh, all kind of confusion. So how is God going to choose them? Number one. And I used to be one of them. So I'm glad I'm out of it, but we thank God for the truth. So when the rapture comes according to them, that so-called rapture, they said that the Christian dead or living will be caught up into the, to the air to meet Jesus in the cloud. Well, think about it. The Bible tells us about the kingdom descending upon the earth. So when you talk about a cloud in scripture, this is just a little hint for you. The cloud doesn't mean a literal cloud. The cloud in scripture deals with the presence of God or the glory of God, okay? Um, and you can take a look at that when you see the pillar that followed them, pillar of cloud by day. It was the glory of God. Now, let's deal with the real fact of the rapture according to the definition uh, by the etymology of the word. The word rapture is a true word. The principle is not in the Bible as they teach it, but the, the event is not in the Bible, but the word rapture means this. It means an act of carrying off. Uh, rapture. It means a seizure, rape, kidnapping, carrying away, abduction, snatching away, rape. You notice these are violent acts. Um, like a child trafficker would snatch a child from a store or somebody would kidnap a person. That's a violent act. And that's what rapture denotes a violent act it doesn't denote like the picture shows people floating up into the sky in clouds in a fleshly form that's not biblical now since we understand that the word rapture means the act of carrying off enslaving kidnapping besieging uh snatching abducting away rape let's see rapture in the scriptures and who was raptured 
okay, according to the definition of the word rapture. So in Genesis 34, verse 1 and 2, and it reads, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And so we have our Israelite sister, Dinah, going out to survey the land in which they were living. Now remember, they are living in uh, Canaan amongst the um, Hamite people. And it says, And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, these are Hamitic, Hamitic people, prince of the country saw her. So when he saw the beauty of Dinah, the Hebrew woman, the, the Israelite woman, when he saw her, this young woman, this damsel, he took her. So he snatched her. He seized her. He carried her off. He took her. All right. And what else? And lay with her. He raped her. All right. That's rapture. All right. And defiled her. So when Shechem did what he did to Dinah, that was a type of rapture. He snatched her, took her away, took her to a hidden place, raped her and defiled her. And he, she, he defiled her because he was unclean and he was laying with the daughters of Zion, which is an, an unholy thing. So there we see the first example of rapture in the scripture. Our sister Dinah, uh, our four from our ancestors was raped. That is a rapture. In Daniel chapter one and one, it says in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem to besiege it. Okay? So now, when we look at that, we I want to share something with you. You got to understand what those names and words mean. What does Jehoiakim mean? What does Nebuchadnezzar mean? And I'm not going to give you too much, but Jehoiakim means the one who God raises up. And he's the king of Judah. So, because Judah was living in sin and rebellion against God, God sent Nebuchadnezzar, all right, to go and besiege Jerusalem and take captive Jehoiakim and all the best people of Israel in Jerusalem into captivity into Babylon. So there we see that's a type of rapture because rapture also means to siege, to kidnap, all right? And so Nebuchadnezzar did that. And then our final witness of rapture in the Bible comes from Deuteronomy 28, 68. And it says, And the Lord shall bring thee, speaking of Israel, into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. And there where you will be snatched, kidnapped, raped, besieged, carried off, there ye shall be sold to your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. So when you look at the condition and the history of what has happened to the Israelites, where everywhere we went into captivity, into bondage, on ships, the same things have happened. The same things happened to our men and our women. We were defiled. We were abused. We have been abducted. We have been robbed of our culture. We were raped. We were defiled, just like Dinah was. That has happened. So I'm going to leave you with this, my brother, my sister. Hopefully, uh, this teaching will open your understanding that there is no such thing as a Christian rapture, according to the Bible. It is Gentile fiction and fable. But unto us, who are of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is Israel, let us press on like our witness Enoch who kept the faith in spite of the warfare and he endured the hardness and he fought until he was able to perfect his soul. So I'll leave you with this thought that as we await the coming of the day of the Lord and nobody knows the day nor the hour when it shall come that we must be found doing the same as our faithful witnesses in the scriptures who kept their faith and endured the shame and walked in the truth. Yahweh Shai is our greatest example. So I leave you with this. May the Most High bless you and uh, 
keep you. Also, if you want further teachings, please uh, go to uh, Lost Sheep of the House of Israel on YouTube. That's our primary channel. And also King James Bible University primary channel. Both places, the teacher is Elder Michael Johnson. He's the teacher. We also have King James Bible University, North Carolina with Elder T. King James Bible University in Georgia, which is Elder Jenkins. Uh, TV, Temecula Valley King James Bible University channel on YouTube is uh, hosted by Elder Smith and his wife. And the newest channel on the block is the OKC King James Bible University channel, which is being taught by our young brother, Deacon Micah. And so why don't you check those out? I'm Elder Fields at San Antonio King James Bible University signing off. I bid you a shalom and a God bless.